traditional meeting uh, and coyotes. And we have been lucky enough to get someone I've known and worked with for many years, Tim Hunter from the city of Edina, who's kind of specialized in this, to come and do a presentation uh, on coyotes. He's done 24 presentations like this in various groups. Um, actually, we all got together a couple of years ago, a bunch of the southwestern metro cities and talked about this issue because it was started way back then. Coyotes have actually been in the city for, I'm sure, five to 10 years. Um, but, you know, they've had some instances recently where they've been brought more to people's attention. So we got Tim to come and do this presentation. We have Karen Schreg from the Nature Center and Scott Ramsey from the Nature Center here as well. Jim Toppetsoffer, who's our Parks and Recreation Director, is here as well, so one of us, as well as one of our council members on the back. So uh, I want to welcome you, and we'll, of course, have time for questions at the end. Uh, just start out by introducing Tim. All right, thanks, Charlie. Mm -hmm. I hope I'm not too loud. Um, the audio system in here is new to me, but I'm going to, if you guys can hear me in the back, can you just raise your hand? Okay. Um, as Charlie said, I'm Tim Hunter. I've been the animal control officer over in Edina for about 10 years now, a little over. Um, how time flies when we have fun. Um, this came up to our attention three, four years ago or so. We had uh, an 18 year old shipper key that was picked up by a coyote in a resident's backyard. Uh, she noticed it, ran out, chased it. The coyote ran about 30 feet, dropped the dog. She stepped over the dog, and the coyote stopped about 30 yards away. She kept yelling and screaming at it. It ran up to her to within about three feet. And in her description, the coyote bounced and lunged, low in front, high in back, back and forth, side to side. And eventually, she just kept screaming and yelling, and the coyote eventually just left. Um, I had an idea as to what, how I would interpret that body language from the coyote, but I wasn't really sure if that translated from my background to what coyotes do. So my first contact was an individual over at the Minnesota Zoo. I was fortunate enough to be put in touch with an individual who had been actually the coyote keeper. He was a wildlife biologist by training. And just by coincidence, he had been the coyote keeper for the Minnesota Zoo for about 10 years. And so I described exactly what um, the woman had told me that she saw. And he said, OK, I don't think there was any problem there. It sounds like it was just the coyote trying to get his food back. It sounded like he was just being submissive and trying to get his food back. But if you really want the real answer, here's a person to talk to. And he put me in touch with the head researcher at the USDA Predator Research Center out in Utah. And when I called her, I talked to her, and I described exactly what I told you. And she said, that is classic textbook submissive behavior on the part of the coyote. And at no point was a human at any risk whatsoever. Now let me ask you, if I'm a coyote and I'm this close to you, are you going to be intimidated? Yeah. So I, I bring that up, one, to kind of give you an idea as to what my trial by fire was getting introduced to this topic, because you can imagine how upset she was that A, her beloved 18-year-old pet had just been picked up and carried by a coyote, but then she'd been confronted by that same coyote within three feet. Not something we all expect, especially in an area that's been 98 to 100% developed, right? So I kind of embarked upon a long process of figuring out what we need to do, what we don't need to do, what has been done, what's worked, what hasn't worked. So what we're going to be talking about tonight, we're going to start out with what the actual risk coyotes actually present to people. So how many people are here because they're concerned about the risk that coyotes present to them? How many people are here because they're worried about the risk that coyotes present to their pets? How many are both? OK. So we're going to start out with the risk to us. Um, now we're going to talk about things that you can do if you don't want the coyotes around. Even before you see a coyote, there's a lot that you can do that, that will help deter coyotes from coming around. You know, if, if you don't put suet out on a bird feeder, you won't get woodpeckers looking for food, right? So it's that kind of logic there. The next thing we'll go into is we're going to look at what hazing tools can be and are and what techniques there are to use them and why. 
Uh, we'll also look at how to identify coyotes. It seems kind of fundamental, but there was a section of our town, okay, there was an entire quarter of Edina that kept reporting coyotes every day. And I got to the point where I'm like, okay, I can't find them. I've been out there when you guys call and I've been looking for them. Do you have any pictures of them? Oh yeah, I got it on my phone. Can you email it to me? Sure. I get it and it's a red fox. <laughs> Okay? And it seems kind of funny, but there's a lot of logic in terms of why somebody might misidentify an animal. But what I found is anywhere between 40 and 60% of my reports of coyotes actually turned out to be fox. Big difference in terms of the animal, big difference in terms of their impact on the environment and on residents in a city. Um, but it, it isn't as weird that somebody should look at a, a fox and say it's a coyote just because of, you know, it, <laughs> Is from here to the back wall 30 feet or is it 30 yards? You know, is, if there's cover or brush in between, how well can you see the animal? How fast is it moving? Is it light? Is it dark? Is it somewhere in between? You know, a lot of things can play with your perception. So it's not un unlikely. So we'll go over some identification cues. Um, then, when we get into the latter part of the presentation, we're going to talk about some of the coyote's behaviors. Because during the time of season, or during the year, their behavior techniques, or their, their behavior patterns, I should say, actually change. That's important because how many of you have small dogs or cats? How many of you have big dogs, like labs? Okay. Now, those of you with big dogs have a completely different set of concerns during a different time of year than the people with smaller pets. And we'll talk about that and why and what you can do to kind of handle that and mitigate it. Um, things that we're not going to talk about, we won't really get into specifics of uh, particular incidents unless I can help use that as an illustration. I'm not a member of the city of Richfield, so I can't speak for them in terms of what all they're doing in that particular instance. So I'm going to be a fish out of water if I try to talk specifically about that. Okay, fair enough? Um, the other things, um, there's a lot of aspects to this. I'm covering what you guys can do. I'm not trying to put this in any way, shape, or form that Richfield is removing itself from the equation because there are definite situations where city government, city management has a responsibility. Just like if you're going to go for a walk in the park, you take a certain responsibility for not tripping over your shoelaces and breaking your nose. But the city takes responsibility in case somebody jumps out of the bushes and mugs you, right? So there, there's a trade-off. And, and where that line lies will depend on what's happening with what the coyotes are doing and things like that. Does that make sense? OK. So to try to put things in a little bit of perspective, coyotes are not a concern to our safety unless we're talking about a bite incident, right? I mean, coyotes aren't going to chase us down and take our purses, take our wallets, take our keys, and, and drive our cars into a bridge embutment, right? <laughs> so we're really kind of worried about whether or not they're going to bite us. So the reality of that, and just looking at California between 78 and 03, 25 year span, there were a total, in 25 years, a total of 79 bites. 35 of them were children, 44 were adults. That breaks down to 3.2 per year, right? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I mean, like we'll, yep, we'll get into that. Yep, good segue. <laughs> so we're looking at, now if we take a look at that, the same incidents on a nationwide basis, the entire 48 contiguous states of the United States plus four provinces of Canada, there were 142 attacks in a 21 year span. So if you take not just California, but the entire nation, you're looking at fewer than seven bites per year. Was okay. the population high in those areas of the coyotes? I can talk more specifically about okay. why it's happening there, right. because it plays directly into why we are at the point that is, it, it's truly a sweet spot in terms of history. All right. Because these areas, the vast majority, as you can see, during the, basically a lot of these years overlap but you're looking at the vast majority, over half occurred just in California. If you take California and Arizona alone, that accounts for over 60% of all coyote bites on humans. So if you take those, those two states out, you're only looking at 40% of the incidents. 
So it's very rare, even more rare, for it to occur anywhere other than California and Arizona. And coincidentally, those are the two states that have had the longest history with coyotes. Okay? They have not done, for the most part, they have done virtually nothing to mitigate their coyote population. As a matter of fact, the city of Phoenix abdicates all of its animal control to the county of Maricopa County. So the city of Phoenix does nothing. And you can imagine an entire county that's responsible for doing this kind of stuff and responding to these things, their resources are stretched pretty thin. So you can imagine how little is actually done. So that's, if, if they're not doing anything, then the coyotes are given the opportunity to get used to every, getting used to being around people. These are reported by the county. Right. I mean, we could probably speculate that there's a number that are unreported. Right. But when I get into the next slide, that's also only reported. So, and also, there's only been two fatalities reported. There's one of a three-year-old in 1981 and a 19-year-old in, 19, or in 2009. Okay. Let's compare that against dog bites. Now, a lot of us raised our hands when we, had, when we talked about who has dogs, right? Every year, there's 4.7 million dog bites in the, in the nation. 700,000 times the number of bites from coyotes. How many people are playing Mega Millions tonight? <laughs> OK? You've got a better chance of getting bit by a dog versus a coyote than you do winning the lottery. So um, 800,000 of these people are <laughs> hospitalized every year from dog bites. On average, 17 people died from dog bites in the 80s and the 90s. Now, talk, speaking to your point about increases and, and so forth, dog bites, the fatalities from dog bites actually increased in the 2000s to 26 per year. Now there's a few reasons for that, but I'm not going to get into dog breeds and why this is happening and why some people are breeding meaner dogs versus not meaner dogs, because this isn't a conversation about dogs. But this is just to put it into perspective. Your dog, your neighbor's dog, the dog down the street across the block or running stray from anywhere in the city is far more dangerous than any coyote you will ever see. Dogs have been bred for generations to not be afraid of humans. And that's why if you go over, if you get into New Jersey, there has been, historically, there has actually been wild dog packs in the Pine Barrens in New Jersey. And they're very dangerous because they don't care about humans. So we don't want coyotes to get anywhere even close to that. Once coyotes, like they are in California and Arizona, places of Colorado, um, British Columbia, coyotes get so acclimated to people that they don't see us as a threat. Okay? So a lot of people say, well, why don't we just go ahead and get rid of them? I didn't see them around before. Now they're here. Can't we just get rid of them? No. And I don't say that because I don't want to. It's because I can't. For one, Coyotes are so secretive and their behavior is such that you will never actually kill all of them. A lot of people will say, well, why don't we just trap them and relocate them? That's a different way of killing them. Because coyotes are so territorial, they will do anything and everything to go home. Up to and including not eating, just running, and they usually die either from resident coyotes because you, don't, you can't put them anywhere that there aren't already resident coyotes, and they will have to fight their way back. They'll get hit by traffic, or they'll starve. So relocation doesn't work for them. A lot like it doesn't necessarily work for white-tailed deer. White-tailed deer will literally stress themselves to death, and they'll get themselves so amped up on adrenaline that by the time a tranquilizer chemical is actually dosed sufficiently to, to tranquilize the animal, it's a lethal dose. So when their adrenaline drops, they are now pumping through with a lethal dose of ketamine or, or other tranquilizers. So deer will actually kill themselves in the process of trying to move them. Coyotes will do essentially the same thing in a different way. They will die either fighting coyotes trying to get home, or they won't eat in the process and they'll starve, or they'll get hit by traffic in the process of getting home. 
So killing, removing, relocation, it's kind of all the same thing, but you can't get them all because they're so secretive. If you put too much pressure on a local population, there's three biological triggers that will allow their population to rebound in less than a year. Um, there was a control study done in Colorado where they had a fixed number of coyotes in a fixed geographical location, and every year for 10 years they killed anywhere from two-thirds to three-quarters of the population. Now, if you kill three out of every four coyotes for 10 years running, you gotta figure that there aren't many left, right? So they figured, all right, we did this for 10 years, now let's see if we let this go, what happens? Within eight months, they had more coyotes than what they started with 10 years before. What happens, um, well this will play into it too, but the first thing that'll happen is generally you remove the dominant pair. They hold a social govern, governor over the rest of the population that allows them to have only one litter per year. On average, about six pups, give or take. If you take out that dominant pair, then that social control is gone, and now you're going to wind up with multiple litters. So if you go from one litter to two litters, you go from six pups to 12, or 18, or however many. If you continue that pressure, they'll actually increase the number of pups per litter. So now instead of six, you get eight or 10, but now you have two litters. So now it's 16 or 20. And you see how that starts adding up real quick. The third level is, I'll get to your question in just a second. The third rank or the third tier of their ability to rebound is they can actually increase the percentage of pups that survive to adulthood. So instead of 40 or 50% surviving to adulthood, you'll get 60 or 70%. Yes, ma'am. How many pups do they have at a time? About six. Oh my God. Normally. Oh. But now keep in mind, if you have six pups, 50% mortality before they hit adulthood, so now you only have three left. Oh. And then mom and dad say, okay, you're a teenager, you're done, you're out of here, you're gone. They kick them out of the territory at the end of the year. And we'll get into how that works a little bit later. But for anybody who's concerned that, okay, we've got two coyotes today, we're going to have four tomorrow, and we're going to have eight the next year, and 16 the year after that, Keep in mind, the environment has a carrying capacity. It will only support so many. There's only so much food in your refrigerator, so you're only going to have people eating at your house for so long before they have to go home and eat out of their own fridge, right? So, and the environment's the same thing. How about, uh, what's the, the coyotes? How big an animal are they? You showed no pictures. We'll get that. This high. We'll get to that, we'll, that. ma'am. We'll get to the identification in the latter part. I've seen the pictures. Yes. Yep, so just hold with me, it'll be a little bit, but I promise we'll get to that. I hope so. Okay. Um, so even if you were able to magically take out all the coyotes in, in Richfield, the coyotes from Bloomington and Minneapolis and Edina will all fill the gap. They're territorial, and so you remember the, the teenagers I talked about that got kicked out of mom and dad's house? Now they're looking for a new territory. So if Richfield is now an empty territory, all the teenagers from all the surrounding areas are gonna take up new residents in, in Richfield, right? So they're territorial. And so the easiest way to manage that is to use that to your advantage. Let the existing coyotes keep all the other coyotes out. There's really only three effective methods to control coyotes by killing them, okay? So let's say we can actually do this, just on a magical basis, we're going to go ahead and kill them, right? The only three effective methods are poison, that's illegal even for states and cities to use, only the federal government allows it to be used. Now if we could magically get a waiver for that, we're still talking about poison. Once you put poison into the environment, you lose control over it. Anybody remember what happened to the bald eagles and the peregrine falcon back in the 70s? DDT? That was poison that was put out for food that we could eat. Killed all the bugs, all the bad weeds, and it made all the birds of prey's eggs fragile. It almost made the peregrines and the bald eagles extinct because there was a poison out there and we, it did what we wanted it to. It killed the bugs, great. <coughs> but it never left. The M44s are the, the name of the, the poison that they use. It's put into bait carcasses and meat. Once it's put out there, anything that eats meat can eat that. 
So you're going to get coyotes, you're going to get raccoons, skunks, shih tzus, las apsos, bourgeois, whatever is out there that likes to eat meat can get into that. Okay, poison. In, this is an editorial. It's, it's not a policy statement necessarily. Some people do agree with me, but poison's bad. I don't like suggesting poison in anything but the most controlled of circumstances. The other way is traps. There's only a handful of traps that work. Offset jaw traps, snares, live traps don't really work. You get about a 1 to 3% chance to catch one coyote, and every other coyote will figure it out. Usually the only coyotes that you're going to get in a live trap are adolescent males. They're some of the most precocious of the, of the species, so they're going to be the most curious and the first to go into a trap. But as soon as Susie sees Jimmy go into the little black cage, and then it shuts behind him and he can't get out, Susie's going to go, aha, I knew you were stupid. <laughs> and she doesn't actually go back in. So now we get smart. OK, well, we got Bobby. Um, now let's put it out, and we're going to try to get Susie. And Susie's going to go, yeah, that's some tasty treats, but there's squirrels and rabbits over here. So I'm not going in the box that Bobby got trapped in. Ain't going to happen. They learn. They're very, very smart. How many of you have really smart dogs? OK. Now to you guys, I say this to anybody who has a really smart dog. It's a double-edged sword, right? They learn things really, really fast. So they can sit, and they can beg, and they can roll over, and they can play dead. But they learn things really, really fast. And that's a bad thing, because they figure out how to open up the doors. They know when you come home. They know exactly how long they have before the door shuts. You know, like your storm door that has that plunger that, that shuts it at a certain rate. They can time that, and they just bolt as soon as they can, right? They learn things, like who's going to feed me at the table, <laughs> right? So really, really smart canines learn things really, really fast. It's bad for the bad things, but it's good for the good things. And we're going to utilize that in the coyotes to be able to teach them to not like us anymore and be afraid. But they learn about traps. Traps are out in the environment. Any animal that is free to roam can hit a trap, whether it's a, an offset uh, jaw trap or a snare or anything like that. St. Louis Park tried a trapping program for coyotes. They caught exactly one raccoon, <laughs> which by the time the trapper got to it, which was just the next morning, there was a raccoon in the trap and coyote tracks all the way around it <laughs> because they knew the, the raccoon would be tasty but they also knew the raccoon was in a trap, and they didn't know if there was another one there. And they weren't going to go near it. And they caught, in addition to one, or one raccoon, they caught one Bashan. Oh. oh my god, that's my dog. <laughs> See? We don't want to catch Bashans. We don't want to catch you know, tortoiseshell cats. We don't want to catch Siberian huskies, right? So once traps are out there, they're very difficult to manage, especially if they're in an area where pets are residents. They're also very time and labor intensive, which means they're expensive. Somebody's got to manage it. Somebody's got to have the expertise to know when, where, and how to set them. And somebody's got to pay for it. In most cities, that means you. Okay. <clears throat> Generally, unless a city allows a trapper to get a variance, they're illegal by ordinance. Edina does not allow snares because we don't want everybody's pet to get snared. We don't want kids to step in an offset jaw trap. We don't want a kid to go up to something and go, what's the ow, and break a finger, right? So there's a lot of reasons to not do that. So they can be set up, but it's very risky. You know, the, the capturing non-target animals, that, that's just buzzwords for saying, we caught your dog. Oops, sorry. And that's not fair to you. It's not a risk that I, as an animal control officer, am willing to take with your pets. So how about we just shoot them? We do it with deer all the time, right? Deer and coyotes are fundamentally different. Being with deer are stupid. 
to get, at least the way we have done it with sharp shooting contracts, you bait the deer into a, a location and you shoot them over bait, okay? As long as you're able to make a nice clean kill, and I don't want to get too graphic because I don't know how sensitive everybody is, but, but long and the short of it is, if Bambi falls over and doesn't kick, we can get Bambi's cousin and brother and everybody else in that group at the same bait station. Coyotes don't do that. Coyotes send in the sacrificial lamb. And that coyote goes in and tries to eat. And the rest of them are off going, how's it going? And if something goes bang and the sacrificial lamb falls over, the rest of them go, guess it wasn't so good. We're going to go over here and eat. And they learn. Now the thing about that is that in Richfield, in Edina, in any metropolitan area, you have a very limited area, a very limited number of areas that you can shoot safely. Once a coyote learns that that's not safe for them to go, you may as well not use that. And now you're limited even further. And eventually all of your safe shoot sites are useless. The other thing, collateral damage and illegal by ordinance, once you shoot a gun, that bullet's gone. You can't do anything about it. If it lands in somebody's living room, if it hits your pet, God forbid it should hit a person, the damage is done, right? Yes? <clears throat> no, but the, bow, the range for a bow hunt is so much shorter, and the way coyotes work, it just would not be effective. Yeah, and they, you just don't get the range. You know, I'm sure there are some hunters out there that say that they can do it. Yeah, because I have a friend who has to come. Yeah, on a large scale, though, it just isn't effective. I have looked online, and Wyzetta uses bows to control their coyotes. I haven't heard anything about how effective it is, but I'll check into that. You said Wyzetta does? On the DNR thing, and Wyzetta has a bow to control their coyotes. Yeah, I'd be interested to know how much of that actually controlled the population and how much of that actually looked like they did. So I'll check into that. I don't have any data, so I can't speak to that good, bad, or indifferent. Um, but discharge of firearms is, for most part, in all the cities, it's a gross, uh, gross misdemeanor, and we don't want anybody going to jail on it. If a city hires somebody to do it, they can get a waiver for the ordinance and stuff. But then we get into the whole collateral damage and you know shoot sites and things like that. Um, I talked about how limited the areas are to actually shoot them. The coyotes learn where where those are and they'll just simply avoid where they get killed. That's just, it's that simple. Um, how many of you have relatives or you yourself as kids used to hunt coyotes on a farm or something like that? Um, people say, yeah, well, we had a sheep farm or, or we had a dairy farm or whatever and every time we saw a coyote, we'd shoot it and we rarely saw them. Yeah, because hunting is one of the most extreme forms of hazing possible. And so all the other coyotes that are seeing ones drop dead figure out that you don't go up by that red building up there because you can get shot by Farmer Jones. <laughs> um, you can't create new safe shooting lanes because you can't tear down somebody's house. Doesn't work. And I talked a little bit about how coyotes are different from deer. So now, any questions on the lethal um, formats? Okay. So even before you see a coyote in your area, there's quite a few things that you can do if you don't want them in your yard to try to mitigate or limit what the coyotes might be looking for. Get rid of any sort of fallen fruit from trees or bushes. Because, surprisingly enough, 30% of everything that a coyote eats is vegetable or fruit matter. When I found that out, I about fell out my chair. Um, they're dogs, right? Dogs eat meat, right? They're carnivores, right? 30% of their diet ain't. Um, I happened to actually be out in Colorado and for fun, believe it or not, I was tracking a coyote across one of the mesas out there. <clears throat> this happened to be down by Castle Rock, if, if anybody knows the area. And I was coming up and over the mesa and I happened to find a, a, a set of droppings from the coyote and there wasn't anything in it but bug carcasses. This guy had been eating beetles and grasshoppers and bugs and worms and stuff and that's all that was in the scat. These guys are really resourceful and they're really opportunistic in terms of what they can eat. So if you're throwing your jack-o'-lantern in your compost heap 
if you've got some leftover macaroni and cheese that you think is going to compost really well, or if you have an open trash can with apple peels and stuff like that, or if you have a delicious Jonathan apple tree in your backyard, they will eat it. So clean up after that. Secure your trash cans. Uh, as you can see, that's an actual photograph of a coyote that has knocked over a trash can and is having a lunch. Um, those are things that, those are attractants. You know, why do I go down to Mystic? Because they have a delicious buffet. I don't gamble, but they've got a delicious buffet. Well, that's Mystic to that coyote. Um, how many of you have fences? How many of you have fences that are at least six feet tall? <laughs> yep. So if your fences aren't at least six feet tall, you don't have fences because they can actually jump up and over and clear those like hurdles. If you have a six foot fence, they'll jump up, they'll grab the top, pull themselves up and jump over. Okay. Now, there's a couple of things that you can do. Richfield has a, a city ordinance that limits your fence to six feet. However, this, let me back up just a quick second. I'm going to talk about two different things. I'm going to talk about the textbook world of how you can keep coyotes out of your yard, and then I'm going to talk about reality. Okay? The reality comes in because we don't all have unlimited budgets. We all have different ideas in terms of what we want our yards and houses and, and lifestyles to look like. We all don't have unlimited opportunities to do everything and everything there could be to be able to limit coyotes in our yard, right? So we've got reality, but the textbook world is you need a fence that's over six feet tall, preferably seven plus, and it's also gotta be, gotta be buried 18 to 24 inches below ground so that they don't dig underneath it. That's the textbook world, okay? Reality, if you have the budget and the interest to get your fence to at least six feet, then this is called a coyote roller. It's a four foot aluminum roller on ball bearings. You can mount it on top of your fence. It'll go on wood fences or chain link like they show here. And what happens is when the coyote jumps up and tries to grab the top of the fence, he has nothing to grab onto. That roller will roll him off. The downside, it's a four foot stretch. And last I checked, it was about 40 bucks a piece. Aluminum, I would expect it would last pretty long. I haven't seen any long-term like consumer reports on it, but it, it gets expensive. And that's where the reality comes in. What's your budget? There's a lot of other easier ways. This will probably not pass muster ordinance-wise. So you have to have the six-foot fence, and then you put this other thing that launches out. And when the coyote tries to jump up, he's got this, this thing that he's trying to jump into. So this part, this angle part, actually faces out from your yard. So they're trying to jump up into that, and they can't actually get up and over that. Um, I'm going to see if this will work. How many of you think that your dogs can't, um, can't get over a chain link fence? You think you're all safe? Your dogs in a chain link fence can't get out? Let's hope this one works. Working so far. OK, it's, it's really quick, so watch. <laughs> Assuming it actually plays. This is a little Yorkshire Terrier, and he's going to show you how chain link works as a ladder. <laughs> and if you <laughs> so that was one example. How many of you have like a medium sized dog, maybe like a beagle or something? Anybody have a beagle? Okay. Think you're pretty safe with a with your beagle in a in a four wall kennel with a walk in door and a roof. Think you're pretty safe on that. <clears throat> this will take a little bit longer. I might have to talk real fast to get all my information in for you. Okay, so we got three beagles here, right? And this, I'm hoping this will go. I may talk this through too. These two guys are, are not the brightest bulbs on the evolutionary tree, but we have Einstein here. <laughs> Look how he's using the corner. He's propping himself up. <laughs> I'll speed this up a little bit. He gets up to the top. He's able to push that corrugated metal up, and he jumps up and over the frame, and he's out. Now, with that setup, how many of you would have thought you could go away for the day and come back and, and 
everybody, including Snoopy, would be in the kennel? I would. So obviously somebody figured out Snoopy was getting out somehow. I'm putting out a camera to figure this out. And voila. You remember me talking about dogs that are really, really smart being a double-edged sword? OK. Coyotes can learn just as quickly. He doesn't do anything too fantastic other than jump down and run away. So I'm going to uh, head over to this next one. This was actually down in Phoenix. This one is a coyote. There's a few things that are really important to watch in this one. One of which is the fact that, keep in mind, somebody's holding this camera. And I'm guessing by the way that the, the camera is traveling, the guy, whoever has got the camera is actually in a car. And he's close enough to get this picture, and the coyote knows he's there because you can see the coyote looking over every once in a while, right? He's perfectly well aware that there's a human in a car following him. Sure doesn't look too concerned to me. So he keeps going down here. This is about a two-minute video. And he walks back and forth. You can see roughly, OK, now, ma'am, to your, to your previous question about how big are these guys, coyotes are just above your knee, OK? This guy is probably, by the looks of him, 30, 35 pounds maybe, OK? Now, when I say knee, that's a lot different. I mean, if you're my height or if you're Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, that makes a big difference in how big your coyote is. But, you know, in general, he's going to be about this high at the back, okay? So about the size of a smallish Siberian husky. Huskies are a little bit bigger of frame, so they run 45, 55 pounds generally. But these guys are going to be 35 pounds, give or take. So just to kind of give you an idea, just above the knee at the shoulder, okay? This is about a five or six foot stucco wall. It's not a fence, but it's a wall. Now, I think I got it in the right spot. He really doesn't care what the guy behind him is doing. He's got a very clear idea as to what's on the other side of the wall. Otherwise, he's not going to be looking around to get up there that much. Now watch him. Did that look like it was a big strain for him? No. So their abilities are not unlike what we've got at home in our, with our dogs. You know, you've got a beagle that can, like, break out of Fort Knox. You know, you've, you've got, you know, a Yorkshire that can climb ladders. And you've got coyotes that are really good athletes. They can just jump up to a wall and pull themselves up and over. So that's why the fences are important. But not everybody's able to afford a fence or want the fence or, you know, you've got your landscaping aesthetics and things like that. Landscaping's important because coyotes are ambush predators. They're, they developed, they evolved on the high plains. They've got really long legs. They, they've evolved to hunt in tall grass and run really fast. They can hit speeds 40, 45 miles an hour. Don't run from them. I can't run 20 miles an hour in my prime, and they'll outrun me. So, um, But they prefer to hunt from ambush, which means they like bushes and things to hide in because it's easier. So if you're inclined to look at your landscaping, you may want to change it, maybe not. If it looks like this and you want to change it, have at it. I love landscaping my yard. I do it about every two or three years. Not completely, but I do go through and change it. You can see the playground here, the play set. This is not a concern to me. You, me, our kids, our nieces, nephews, grandchildren, cousins, whatever, are not on a coyote's menu, period. So that's not a concern. But if I've got a pet, I may want to know where the possibilities of a coyote being are, and it would be in through here. I'm not necessarily going to change my landscaping, but I want to be aware of what's possible, right? Now, if I do want to change it and I want to make it less friendly to an ambush predator, I'm going to take up all that cover and make it so I at least can see what's underneath it. So you see this landscaping is all trimmed up, nothing big enough for anything to hide in it. Even these spruces back here are trimmed up six, eight feet. No great shakes, not too much work. I can look out, 
on any given day and see what's underneath my trees. So then I know right away if there's anything out there I need to be concerned about. Yeah, exactly. that's a good point. Charlie was saying it's also a good crime prevention strategy because if you don't have those bushes right next to your basement window, you don't have those crooks that are able to kind of wiggle on your window and unseen until they can get in. So, yeah, I just spent two months slowly taking out old windows in my basement and putting in glass block because of exactly that reason. I didn't want people getting in my basement. Um, how many of you have sheds or outbuildings, decks? Make sure that they're secured around the bottom. This guy's super cute, he's a little red fox, but coyotes will do exactly the same thing. If they don't have to make their house, they will take advantage of whatever there is that keeps them out of the elements. And if your shed is it, they're gonna get underneath it. Yes, ma'am. How big is a, a fox? A fox will be just below your knee, so about this high. Because I have a deck that's probably a foot and a half high. You could get, you could get I anything. Rabbits, I know that. They all pop out. <laughs> if you have rabbits under your deck, you no longer have a deck. You have a refrigerator. Oh, really? You have a pantry. <laughs> well, you have a pantry. Let me put it that way. If you have rabbits living under your deck, that's what fox and coyotes are looking for. Oh. So all the more reason. This, a lot of what we're talking about goes way beyond coyotes. Okay, We're talking about coyotes because that's what we have some concerns about. But these techniques work for fox, skunks, raccoons, rabbits, squirrels, chipmunks, groundhog. If it's got fur and it's an annoyance under your deck, this will work for it. Yes, ma'am. And I should actually put something on that goes yes. down to the ground. Absolutely. Right Even underneath the ground, 6 to 8 inches minimum, 12 to 18 if possible, because rabbits dig, groundhogs dig, you know, and if you get them underneath there, you now have a pantry for coyotes and fox to come in and eat what's living under there. Don't feed your German, or your dog, your cat, your whatever on your deck. Otherwise, you're going to get Pepe Le Pew out there. You're going to get raccoons out there. You're going to get, did I mention coyotes are opportunistic? Are what? They're very opportunistic. They will eat whatever they can. Okay? You and I go through Burger King drive through for a reason because it's short, it's easy, it's quick. I'm not going to say it's good. Yes, but it's easy, right? Okay, Purina is not the best food for dogs on the planet, but it's better than nothing, and it's quick and it's easy, and if it's left outside, all the wildlife will eat it too. Not to mention that it'll also bring in mice and chipmunks, and how many of you have ever had a mouse infestation in your garage or your house, right? They're not fun, okay? That can happen. So no, don't leave your pets out unsupervised. Don't feed them. Cats, hands down, without exception, without argument, are safest indoors 100% of the time, period. I know a lot of people say, well, they like to go out. Yeah, that doesn't mean that they should. Cat versus Buick, cat loses. Cat versus raccoon, the best you're going to get is a really big vet bill. Okay, Cat versus rabbit, you might wind up uh, with a present on your doorstep, but I had, we had a cat at one time that loved going after weasels. Only cat I ever knew that won. Um, don't feed them outside. And clean up around bird feeders. Coyotes may or may not eat the bird seed you put out, but I will guarantee they eat everything that eats bird seed. Birds were not gifted with the Miss Manners version of table manners. They scatter seed all over the place. And then that brings in mice and chipmunks and squirrels and everything else. It brings birds off the feeder onto the ground. And everything that eats birds and squirrels and mice and chipmunks come in after that. Cooper's hawk, sharp shins hawks, um, owls, uh, red tails, fox, the neighbor's cat. You know, fox will come in. You get all that, that whole microcosm of the ecology centered around your bird feeder. So I'm not saying take them down unless that's something that you don't want to be seeing. But if you're concerned about coyotes or fox or something in your backyard, make sure you keep all that stuff cleaned up. Okay, now why should we bother hazing coyotes? Hazing is nothing more than a simple term that says scare the bejesus out of the coyotes. 
Well, we talked about the lethal methods and why they don't work long term. <laughs> lethal method, methods can be done to give you, a, to kind of put it into money terms. I talked to an individual who does this for a living. He contracts with multiple cities out in California. He gets paid, at least from one of the cities, he gets paid $30,000 a year just to go in and shoot a couple coyotes a year. Now, if you go back to the original, the, that, that closed study I talked about, about coyote population, and you apply it to this guy. So we're only looking at Richfield. You hire somebody to come in and use lethal methods on coyotes. And you, he goes along for 10 years, and everything's hunky-dory. But then something weird happens, because the city's paying this guy 30 grand a year, mind you, right? Now, let's say something weird happens, like, oh, I don't know. Let's say a housing bubble happens. That never happens, right? And then the budget crashes and you have to make cuts. Well, this guy that we're paying 30 grand to isn't actually an employee, he's a contractor, so let's go ahead and cut him. Within a year, you're gonna have just as many or more coyotes than you started with, and you've already spent $300,000 on them over 10 years. Is that a fair use of your tax money? I would, I would argue no, okay? I don't, I don't think lethal methods work well enough to be worth the money that you spend on them. The problems with coyotes only arise when the resident populations of, of coyotes become so used to human populations and human activity that they're not scared of us anymore. We live in an area now where coyotes normally would be scared of cougars and bears and wolves. We don't have those here. Okay, so that leaves the coyotes at the top of the food chain. So what are they afraid of? Nothing, unless we make ourselves scary to them. If they're afraid of us, they're not gonna mess with us. Hazing makes them afraid of us. It reestablishes that, that link. It reinforces their, their fear of humans and it'll break that cycle of conflict. Now the cycle of conflict I'm talking about is what we've seen out in Arizona and California that we talked about before, where they didn't do anything. And now they're stuck with these coyotes that are so used to people that they come up to them and they expect to be fed. This happens for one of two reasons generally. People are actively feeding them. I don't know why. I'm not gonna hand a T-bone steak to a coyote. I don't care what you say. Or they're doing it accidentally because they leave their garbage open, they leave the compost heap open, they have food somewhere in their yard that can be accessed by the coyote. So they're kind of inadvertently feeding the coyotes. And the coyote's coming into the backyard, somebody steps out on the deck, the coyote looks up and goes, oh, it's you. You gonna do anything? No? All right, I'm gonna keep eating. And they learn that we're not a threat to them. Case in point, in, uh, I don't know if any of you heard this story, it was actually aired on a Twin Cities TV station, on a news station. It came from Peoria, Arizona. A gentleman woke up after having fallen asleep on his very own lounge chair on his very own patio on a very nice, sunny Arizona afternoon. And when he woke up, he figured his wife was shaking his leg to say, hey, come on in for dinner. <laughs> and he looked down and his wife looked awful darn furry and an awful lot like a coyote. And it kind of hurt because the coyote was shaking him by the calf with his teeth. You can imagine, people were a little upset. Short story, there were two people in Peoria that were actively putting food out for the coyotes, because God forbid that coyotes might starve if somebody doesn't feed them. Um, so the coyotes had come to expect humans to be a source of food, and when this guy was sleeping, they figured, ah, let's, let's see if he is food, let's test him. So they bit him just to see if he's gonna react, and they figured out, oh, well, he is alive. We're not going to eat that, so we're going to go over here. So they started seeing people as food, or at least sources of food. But that's because people are actively feeding them. And that's where I was talking about we're in a sweet spot in history because we have the point here where we're not doing that. We're not running into that problem so we can head it off at the pass. Hazing will reestablish and reinforce that fear of humans that we need coyotes to have. The other thing... Um, is that it puts you in control of the situation. What I found generally is that people are afraid of coyotes because they don't feel like they have control over any sort of an encounter. If I walk down a walking path and a coyote jumps out in front of me 
and I don't feel like I can control that encounter, I'm going to be afraid. Hazing gives you control of that situation. It gives you the ability to understand what to expect, what you can do, and you know what will work. The other thing about wildlife, and we touched on this, is that you only have three options whenever you see any wildlife. You can make it come closer because you want to have that perfect wildlife picture or you want to try to pet it or something. You can do nothing or just simply ignore it. Or you can try to get it away. You don't like it, you hate it, or you just don't want it in the area, right? So you can scare it away. Those are really the only three things. You can do something positive, something neutral, or something negative. Well, if you do either of the first two, it's got no negative consequences to that wildlife whatsoever. How many of you have ever known somebody that had a squirrel that lived in the tree outside but was so tame it would come up on their knee and take a peanut or something like that? All that is is acclimation. They, that squirrel gets used to somebody not being a threat, that it knows it can come up for the peanut and not be worried. Ours came in the house. <laughs> See? Same thing can happen to coyotes. So we around the block. So hazing is the one thing that you can do simply, easily, free, that will reestablish that negative consequence. It'll give the coyote something to be afraid of. It's not working. It's not working. Not in our neighborhood. It's not working. Well, we can talk about that, but let me go through the methods and we'll see if it's actually being done. Because I've had people say, oh, I've been hazing the coyote. He's in the back of my lot, and I stand on the deck and I do this all the time. <laughs> and he just stands there and look. I was out at the guy's lot. The coyote was sitting 50 yards away, 150 feet away, half a football field away, and the guy wasn't coming off his deck. One, 50 yards is OK. But if you still don't want him in that close of proximity to your yard, you need to go out and tell him, you're not welcome. Hazing is basically, in, in coyote language, saying, you're not welcome. You can't be here. You're not safe here. And when you stop, it, well, <clears throat> well, we'll get to that. We can talk about that. The other thing about hazing is that you're, you're utilizing the coyote's learning habits, their ability to learn very quickly to readjust their behavior. They teach their young what to eat, how to eat, where to hunt, when to hunt. And if you teach them also what to be afraid of, they will teach their offspring what to be afraid of. And it becomes a generational thing. It can be done immediately. The one thing I can guarantee is every time you guys encounter a coyote, you're there right now. The other thing I can guarantee is no matter how fast you dial 911, no matter how fast my red lights work, how fast I can drive, I will never be there as fast as you are. And almost invariably, by the time somebody that you have to call arrives on scene, the coyote will be gone. So in truth, whoever has that encounter with the coyote is the only one that has the immediate opportunity to have an impact on that coyote. It's free. It doesn't really have any potential for uh, collateral damage. If I wind up scaring my neighbor's nephew, meh, no harm, no foul. Like a horn at 6 in the morning. Yeah. Neighbors might, might not be too happy. They might not be. But at the same time, if everybody's on the same page in the neighborhood, they'll understand that there's a coyote in the backyard, and that air horn being blown next door means the coyotes should be running away. So if everybody's on board with it, that brief time of being woken up should be acceptable. I'm not saying it will be. Textbook, reality, right? So the other thing about this is that we're, it's legal for everybody, and it doesn't matter which side of the coyote fence you sit on. If you love coyotes and really want them around, you don't want them to get in trouble, right? So keep them afraid of people. If you hate coyotes and don't want them around ever, scare them so they don't like us anyway, and then they won't be around. So when you do see a coyote, what do we do? And tell me if, if we're close to what you guys are doing. OK. And that's good. The more varied your techniques, as, as we look at this, the more of a variety you're using, the more consistently you're doing, and the more people in a neighborhood that are doing it, the better. If you've only got one or two in a big neighborhood, it's probably not going to have much impact. Don't run from a coyote. Regardless of what the next two statements say, the biggest thing, in coyote language, when you run from a coyote, if I go this way, it tells the coyotes over here, 
I'm running from them, that I'm on their territory, and they have every right to be there, and I don't. Which is exactly the opposite of the message we want to give them, right? We want them to be afraid of us, right? So we want to be able to stand our ground and say, you're on our territory and you need to leave. You need to get the coyote's attention. Don't do any of this from inside a house. Don't do any of it from inside a car, behind a bush, in the garage, on your deck. Get out there. Get their attention so that they understand that you are the threat, that you are the reason that they're scared and running away. Okay? They have to be able to draw that cause-effect relation. Otherwise, they're not going to understand what the threat is. Okay? They see houses all the time. Some of the time there's going to be a TV blaring, some of the time there's going to be a radio, sometimes there's going to be people talking, yelling, shouting, hooting, hollering, but the house never moves. The house never attacks them. The house never goes after them. That's why you have to get out and say, I'm the thing on two legs, I'm coming after you, and you need to be afraid. I'm going to take a moment here and also say, all of this, I'm talking about textbook, please, please, please take into account the environment, we've got ice and snow out there, take in your own physical capabilities. I don't want anybody getting hurt doing this. It's not really worth that. But there's a lot that you can do within your own physical capabilities that will help this all work. Make sure the coyote is able to run away. If they're sick or injured or cornered, they're not going to be able to run away. So then their, their, their desire to run away will turn into a defense mechanism. Make sure they've got somewhere to run, and that you know if it can't run away, it's, it's not going to be effective. Now, I have had people say, "How in that type of a situation, how am I going to be able to make all these decisions? You're asking me, is a coyote sick? Is it injured? Can it run? Does it have somewhere to go? How do I do this? Is the coyote in a field? Yep. It's got somewhere to run because it's not fenced in, right? Super easy. Is it bleeding? Is it doing something like staggering around and like it's drunk or can't keep its balance? Does it have a, a leg that's kind of flopping around or something like that, like it might have gotten hit by a car? Um, is it walking around in circles and not really able to pay attention to anything around it? You'll see these behaviors. It's not any sort of in-depth veterinary exam. You know, is it a coyote that's standing on all four legs and it's perky and alert? Okay. Is it fenced in or anything? Nope. Good to go. Scare it, haze it, do whatever you can. But if it's in, a, in cornered in a fenced yard, or if it seems to be falling over or losing its balance, leave it alone. Okay, I don't know if you'll be able to see this picture. This person here is doing one of these. What do you think they have in their hand? A camera, right? The coyote is in the middle of a street. You really think he cares what the person with a camera has? Yeah. This is an example of the person, basically, everybody there is basically doing option two, nothing. They're not trying to scare it, they're not trying to entice it, they're getting that perfect wildlife picture of, oh look, there's a coyote in the street. And he knows he's not in any sort of a threatening situation. Nobody's going to chase him, nobody's going to throw rocks at him or anything. He doesn't think anything of him. Why? Because nobody's actually threatening him. So for hazing to be effective, the first thing you need to do is get their attention. Does that look kind of intimidating? If you're 20 yards, 10 yards, 30 feet, if you're from here to the back wall away from a coyote and he's doing that to you, if he's from me to you away and he's looking at you like that, are you kind of intimidated? I hope not, because that's kind of how they work. Yeah. They generally travel in a very level pattern. Their tails are most often dropped down. They don't have that high head posture unless they're alert and looking around for something, but you want them looking at you, okay? If you have pets or kids, pull them in as close to you as you can, get them behind you if at all possible. This is not a defensive maneuver, okay? If that coyote is paying attention to your dog on an extension leash 30 feet over there, do you think he gives one rip about you? Nope. He's trying to figure out if I run 40 miles an hour and snatch that dog 30 feet away from that person, can he catch me? That's what he's doing. But if your dog's right here, that coyote has no option but to pay attention to you, okay? It's not a defensive thing. You're not protecting your dog or your kids or whatever. You're getting the coyote to pay attention to you so that when you haze it, 
it understands that that threat's coming from you. And then that's what you're going to see. Okay? Now, if you notice, you've got a really gray coyote there and there. When we get into some other pictures, you'll notice the color variation is pretty wide within the species. You've got red ones, reddish brown, you've got tan, you've got gray, so it, it varies. Tools of the trade for hazing. These are two things I hope you always have with you. Your voice and your body. If you don't have those, you might want to check with somebody. Okay? The easiest thing, yell, scream, you know, wave your arms, stomp your feet. If you're able to and, and the weather permits and so forth, chase them. Because that tells them you're not welcome, you're on my territory, you better get out. That's normal wildlife behavior. How many of you have seen squirrels chasing one another? A lot of that is territorial behavior. My tree, your tree kind of thing, right? Same thing in coyotes, fox, and all sorts of things. So you've got that with you all the time. Except there was about two weeks, two years ago, where I didn't have my voice, but that kind of sucked. Noisemakers. If you got these left over from New Year's, keep them. Air horns. You can buy these for about a buck at the dollar store. Yes, they can be annoying to your neighbors at 6 a.m., but if everybody in your neighborhood's on board with coyotes need to be afraid of us, you don't have to agree whether they can be around or not be around. As long as you agree that they need to be afraid of us, everybody should be on board with that. Um, you can also, for all I care, go ahead, go to the marina, get the big cans. You know, but these are easier to carry, okay? Um, cans with pennies. Or, as I found out, planters, you know, the planters' peanuts that come in the plastic bottles, if you eat them down to about that many left, they work really well, too, because it's super loud, you shake it. And the best thing, with like just a regular can, like a, a Mountain Dew can or something, put about a dozen pennies, put a piece of tape over the top so they don't fall out, you shake it, it's super loud. You can even throw it at the coyotes. And if you're a better shot than me, you might actually hit them. But the fact of that landing next to them is going to uh, have a big effect on them. Whistles, I'm kind of mixed on that. I don't like the whistles that have a nice, clear tone. Like if you've got a whistle that, that will have a perfect A tune to it, or B or B flat, I don't like those. I like, like the coach whistles that are like really rattly, that real chaotic, annoying sound. That's what you want, okay? Water hoses, not so good in this weather, but if you happen to be out gardening, I've had a lot of people say, yeah, I was just out there gardening and, and a coyote showed up on the other side of the lawn. Well, if you have the, the hose, go ahead and spray them. You know, anything that you can do to reach out and touch them. By the way, anybody have wild turkeys over here? This works on them too. Anything that can reach out and touch wildlife, <laughs> and, <laughs> it's possible. Um, squirt guns. You know, if your niece or nephew have a super soaker that's been long overdue to be retired, put vinegar or something in it. Just, ammonia, too. ammonia can work. The only thing about ammonia is just make sure it works okay with the plastic. You know, it might eat the plastic away. I don't know. I haven't tried ammonia specifically, but yeah, anything that's annoying and, and really irritable, uh, it can be used as an irritant. Pots and pans. I would recommend, you know, ones that you're going to throw out anyway, but, you know, it's like, I, I have a bunch of Teflon coated ones, so if I start banging them, the Teflon coating won't work so good. But, you know, you get, kind of get my drift. Pretty much anything that makes enough noise, you can throw things at them, you can take rocks, you can do whatever you can. Anybody remember wrist rockets when you were kids? As long as you're not putting out anybody's windows, no. you know. No. No. no? Okay. Well, then I guess there is an ordinance against that. Um, you, just, you can't fire any kind of projectile over the city. Okay. You can throw all kinds of things. Even in their, your own yard? You can't, yeah. you can't throw it over the fence in the nature center, though. We live at the nature center. If you throw things over the fence, we're littering, essentially. And that's something that you'll have to work out with, with the city of Edina. Stick, a yep. stick or a rock or Yeah, but a, like penny, a, a, a bottle full of pennies, <laughs> we throw it over the fence to get rid of the coyotes, you're littering. Well, then use something different. It won't be. So like a stick or a rock. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there are things, again, that you need to do to try to, to mitigate or match ordinances. So, I mean, there, there's other alternatives. You don't have to use 
use you know cans with pennies in it. You don't have to use anything that's going to get you into trouble. Um, you know, and not to get too gory about it, but the disposition of the coyote's health is irrelevant. They're an unprotected species, so if if you huck a rock at it and he keels over from fear and dies, no harm, no foul. The key there is that you're not violating any ordinances through the method, so you can't, you know, no projectiles, so no bows and arrows, no wrist rockets, no guns, no, no BB guns, no pellet guns, no paintball guns, things like that. But you can throw everything you want. You can throw the kitchen sink if you want. Just don't hit your neighbor's house. Yes, ma'am. You know, I I watched a YouTube video Scott put out. Um, I like the idea of ammonia. Will the ammonia work if you put it out in various areas, even though it's freezing weather? Ammonia is basically a scent deterrent. Yeah. And here's my take on all scent deterrents, whether it's for deer because they're eating your roses, or rabbits because they're eating your hostas, or coyotes because they're just there. Everybody here has a different tolerance in terms of like what they like to eat, spicy, hot, food. You know, um, I was in a garbage house just earlier today. We would all have a different reaction to the odors and, and the various and sundry scents in that house. Similarly, with the ammonia, coyotes will have a, a variance within their individual reaction to that. You will also have to reapply it periodically because of snow or rain or fog or whatever, just simple evaporation. But here's, here's the truth about it. If it's inexpensive and easy to do, give it a shot. If it works, fabulous. If it doesn't, you know, you're Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison never had a failure. <laughs> Somebody asked him one time, you tried a thousand things to figure out the filament for an incandescent light bulb. You failed a thousand times. How do you feel about that? He said, I, I, I never failed. I now know a thousand things that will not work as a filament in a light bulb. <laughs> right? So if you try ammonia and it works, great. If it doesn't, OK, ammonia doesn't work. Move on to the next thing. Yes, ma'am. Um, my husband was reading something about you putting wolf urine or mountain lion urine or cougar urine around kind of the same thing. territories. Let me repeat that with one exception. That's a lot more expensive than ammonia. So give it a shot. It might work. If, if it's in your budget okay. and you're willing to try it, do it. But here, my one concern about that is that if the, if the coyotes have never had an association with yeah. wolves or cougars that would give them an association of danger to that, it may not have an effect. But, like I said, you know, it's not going to hurt. It doesn't take a huge amount of effort to go ahead and put that out and try it, right? So if it's in your budget, give it a try. It doesn't right? hurt non-targeted animals. Oh, no, no. This is just scent stuff. So even a non-targeted, your dog goes out in the yard and smells wolf urine. It's like, oh. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go mark my tree over here. I'm going to leave that one alone. Yeah, so no harm, no foul. You know, so um, when do you haze a coyote? Textbook, each and every time you see it. Reality, I'm a half hour late for work and there's one down the block, I need to go to work. Okay, but ideally everybody in the neighborhood's doing it each and every time a coyote shows up and you're doing it for as long as you possibly can to get them out of the area. Textbook, reality, every chance that you can and everybody in the neighborhood who can and will. You're always going to have a curmudgeon that says, screw it, price is right is on. <laughs> you know, you can't prevent that, but you do as many as you can as often as you can. Yes, sir? Is hazing uh, actually evidence of population control or population decreases because of hazing, or is it just humans seizing control of the boundaries? It, it's an establishment of territory. It's a behavioral modification thing. They will not chase them out of the area. They will become active when we are not. So basically, it, it's threat avoidance, right? So if you, let me paint a hypothetical scenario, because I know nobody here speeds, right? But if you drive 80 miles an hour down 66th Street and you get busted for speeding every time you do it at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, you're likely to try it at 6 p.m. If you get busted every time at 6 p.m., you might try it at midnight. And if you don't get busted at midnight, that's when you're going to drive 80 miles an hour, right? It's threat avoidance, right? 
Same thing with coyotes. So every time you can, when you can, everybody that can, that's the reality. Not, it, you know, it's, there's going to be gaps. Coyotes, how do you do it? Start with waving your arms, yelling, chasing. These guys are not used to being hazed. So this may get into what you were talking about earlier, right? Okay. <laughs> they may not really understand how to take it. They may be looking at you like, are you serious? Are you really trying to threaten me? I don't get it. And so you start with this. If they're not reacting, you escalate it. So that's where like the shaker cans, running towards them, being very aggressive about defending your territory. Think about this in coyote language, right? So be as aggressive as you can and as you're able. And I think we'll be able to look at it here. There's actually a video I've got that shows a, a news guy with a camera hazing a coyote. And the coyote is literally like from me to you away before he actually breaks. He's kind of cowering and kind of leaning down like, are you really serious? Is this threat really coming at me? They're just assessing, am I still safe? Are you just kind of cranky today? No. And so what they'll do is they'll run, they'll look at you, and then if they really figure out that you're serious, then they'll run 10, 20, 30 feet away, and they'll stop and they'll look back at you. And if you keep it up, or if you don't keep it up, you just told them, okay, you're safe. But if you keep it up, then they'll run a little ways further. First couple times, they'll still come back. But that's where the consistency comes up. You look like you have a question. I've been hazing for six weeks, two months now. Okay. No avail. Okay, so say I do haze and they, they decide, okay, they're not going to win the day. They're on my deck at night all noon and they turn. Okay, it's safe at night. Okay, so you have, do you actually have tracks on your on your deck? Yes. Okay. Well, we hear them. We're two houses down. Yeah. And we hear them all hours of the night. Yep. Now, acoustics are a really funky thing. I've seen them. No, I understand. I understand. But one thing I want to make sure everybody's clear on, their voices and their vocalizations are designed to carry miles, right? Their vocalizations are designed to tell the neighbors way, way, way down the road, this is my territory. Get out. Okay? Stay out. So, and then you start looking at topographical acoustics. So, like, you have valleys or whatever. You're, you're in a bowl. We've got several areas in Edina where all the houses are built around ponds. And somebody's dog will bark, and they'll say, I'm positive it was that house over there. And I get over there, and it's really this dog, and the bark is echoing around, right? So you get some changes like that. So I'm not saying that anybody's wrong. I'm just saying keep that in mind when you're trying to figure out where these guys are sitting, okay? They, they may very well be very close. All five of them. <laughs> yep, and when you see them, that's a guarantee. If you see them, you know they're there, right? You see them every day. Yeah. Multiple times throughout the day. So, do you have any idea what they're coming up on your deck for? Do you have bird seed up there? Bird seed, but they, they just walk into it. Okay. So you have a bird feeder on your deck? Yes. It's down. It's, well, it's right below the deck. And, okay. And I keep the, and Sissel is the only food they'll eat. Uh -huh. And they doubled out. They also mark their territory. Do you have pets? Okay. How long of a leash? I'm right with him. Okay, so like a six foot leash, you don't use an extension leash. No, okay. I don't. I used to, but I don't. Okay. Good. Okay. Small. I can never let him in the yard tethered up ever again. Right. That's true. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm not gonna say that this is fair, but it is a reality. Okay. Coyotes are not going away. We can't pave over the cities and put a dome over the, the city and keep everything out. It's, you know, it, you, could, you could repair the fence around the city. Just, well, that's what I was wondering. Well, How tall is that fence? And I don't know. I don't know, but also keep in mind, the nature center isn't their only habitat. Right. Okay? They are, they're all over. Okay? Now, just take Edina for an example. Okay? I've got a pair in Pamela Park. I've got a family group north of the high school. I've got a family group up by Interlock and Boulevard, or Interlock and Country Club, which, by the way, we share generously with Hopkins and St. Louis Park. Okay, These guys don't know political boundaries, so they're going all over. Um, so similarly, you're going to have coyotes. I'll guarantee you have them over in Veterans Park over here. right? You've, you've got the airport property. You've got uh, the Nature Center. 
you've got people's backyards. Now, how many of you live on a lot where you have a wooded section and it's very convenient to have wood piles back there because that's where you cut your brush and your prunings and everything and they go back there? How many so have do that? Do they make dens back in there or do we know if they are making dens outside of the nature center? I don't know the geography and I haven't actually tracked coyotes over here, so I wouldn't be able to answer that. I guarantee they don't have dens right now. Yes, yes you will. Um, but for those of you who have brush piles, those are pantries. Because what hides in those, rabbits and squirrels and chipmunks and stuff, that's what the coyotes are going to come looking for. For those of you who have pets, like a small dog, they know you have a small dog. Now, the more you can scare them away, well, and why, how, do you, how do you haze them when you do? Together I've like run that. after them with hand covers. They just go around the corner. Yeah. Yep. So, but how far ahead of you? How far are they from you when they run? Oh, maybe from here, pretty And I, I, I just had knee replacement. I can't run down yep. the hill after them. Right. So. so you're doing what you can, right? How many? How many? You guys seem to be fairly close neighbors. Okay. So all of you that are close enough, the more consistently you guys do it across all your yards, the better off you're going to be. I'm not saying that this is not removing the coyotes from your territory, okay? Hazing does not remove coyotes from an area. It adjusts their behavior, okay? So I talked a little bit about what to expect. They're not going to run away immediately. They're going to run just a few feet or a few yards and they're going to turn around and look. Once they know what your capabilities, willingness, determination to threaten them is, they're going to adjust. So if their comfort level initially is this, and you scare me, I may come out here. And if you keep scaring me, I'm going to come over here. If you stop scaring me, I know I'm safe. So I've just adjusted from two feet to 10 feet. And that's all it will be, because I can learn what my safe zone is, OK? So there are risks that we're going to have, OK? I don't want to imply in any way that this is a guaranteed fix that as soon as this is all done, tomorrow we can let our pets out in our yard because we can't. For a lot of reasons, not just coyotes, fox, raccoons, skunks, bald eagles, gold, um, great horned owls are all threats depending on the size of the pet. If you have a two or three pound teacup Yorkie, you better watch out for a great horned owl. Okay? If you've got a 10 or 15 pound, um, I don't know, Bashan maybe, right? Look out for a bald eagle, okay? Look out for fox. And if any of your dogs, I don't care how big they are, go nose to nose with a raccoon over some food, call your vet, because your dog will probably win or at least survive, but you're gonna have a big vet bill. So what we're talking about here, yes, it's, we're talking coyote, but please keep in mind, this applies to a lot of wildlife, because coyotes aren't the only threat out there. Yes, ma'am? Can a fox jump over a 36-inch chain fence? Yeah. can climb trees. Really? Like gray fox can, can, yeah. Yep, we'll get... What kind of fox? Gray fox can actually what climb trees. Oh, yep. my God. I'm yep. Gonna so you're going to have to be most aggressive initially. And depending on how they're reacting, you're going to have to measure that for yourselves. But you'll have to be most aggressive initially, and they may come back afterwards. Okay? So get their attention. Get between the coyotes and the and kids and pets and stuff. We talked about that not being a defensive maneuver, but getting their attention. Continue it until the coyote has left the area. Again, textbook, reality. Textbook, keep going. Reality, until you're comfortable with their far enough away. Use a variety of methods, use a variety of people. Don't haze the obviously sick or injured. Um, don't haze from inside the car or a house or behind cover because they're used to seeing these things. Cars are all over the place. They see them all the time. Cars are not threats. Um, coyotes are smart enough to actually figure out traffic patterns, and they can actually cross six-lane freeways. There's actually been traffic footage where coyotes will cross three lanes, jump up on the Jersey barricade, watch traffic, and as soon as it's clear, they jump down and cross the other three lanes. So cars don't scare them. People on two legs out in the open chasing them do. Don't haze preemptively, and what that means is that if you're walking on a trail, don't like rattle a can or yell or scream or, or blow a, an air horn every 30 feet. 
because that becomes ambient noise, not unlike the jerk on 66 honking his horn behind somebody just because he's a jerk. Um, so that's what preemptively is. You need to direct it at the coyote when you see him so he understands that cause-effect relation. And don't allow them to stay in the area because then they win. Okay? This is all, all this is is a territorial contest. Whose territory am I on? And if I'm on yours, I'm going to be a lot sneakier about staying around and eating your rabbits. Because how many of you have gardens? How many of you like letting the, the rabbits in to eat all of your vegetables? Or the chipmunks coming in to eat the bottoms out of your tomatoes so you don't get any good tomatoes this year because the little crappy chipmunks, <laughs> um, <laughs> Coyotes and fox eat them. They do a great pest service for us. So, I mean, we want them in the area, but we don't want them to be a problem, right? So remember, be aggressive, use a variety of techniques and tools, don't be afraid, and be diligent about it. I know it's frustrating when they're not reacting initially. You know, and I know that the people from Wood Lake and, and Charlie and everybody, they understand these techniques, and I'm sure they're willing to talk to you about how you're doing it and so forth. If you need, I, they can give you my phone number and I can talk you through it. If, if we do talk, the one thing I have to ask is that you be brutally honest about what you're doing and how you're doing it. Otherwise, I won't be able to walk you through how to improve it. So like the guy that said, I kept yelling at him and waving my arms and stomping. And I was, where were you? On the deck? Where was the coyote? Back in my lot. And I'd been on his lot because he'd asked me to come out and look for a den that he was sure was there. And I knew that the back of his lot was off the deck, down to the pond, across the pond, and into the weeds. This, this coyote was 40, 50 yards away, literally. And the guy thought that doing this from his deck was going to scare him. It won't. And frankly, if a coyote's 50 yards from you, I'm OK with that. Because a coyote is, if, he's, if that's his perimeter, you're safe. So any questions? Bef what we're going to go into here is kind of, it's going to be kind of a speed version of the, the behavior and identification. Yes, ma'am. I was reading that um, to be careful from dusk to dawn. Is this a daytime thing? Yes. 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 Yeah. Oh, yeah, and we'll get into their behavior. Um, coyotes are not nocturnal. In a normal setting where we don't exist and everything else does, those things that threaten coyotes are active during the day. The best cover for them is at night. The food they eat is most active, what they call crepuscular times, dusk and dawn, and overnight, which is nocturnal. So if you're going to eat, you want to go out when the restaurants are open, right? If the restaurants are not open, if the food's not out and available at noon, when do you go out to eat? Midnight, right. So why are so, we seeing them in the daytime so much? Because in a city, in the yes. Sunday, yeah. Sunday yep. the all day exactly. I can't yep. hear food. So the reason that coyotes are out during the day in the city is because one, they've got nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing that's going to eat them during the day. So they have no reason to restrict their activity. Two, their food is active all the time. We see rabbits and squirrels and all mice, chipmunks, everything active throughout the course of the day and, and night. So they're going to go out whenever they want to get a snack. You know, if I got a really tasty tidbit in my fridge, I might get up at midnight and go get something. Or maybe I'll wait until 9 o'clock in the morning after I've rolled over and taken another nap the three times, and I'll get up and get a snack. Or 3 o'clock in the afternoon after I've been working. You know, I'll eat whenever I want because I have no threat preventing me from eating whenever I want, and my food's available 24-7. Coyotes are exactly the same. Assuming that I would be... I wouldn't see them as often as you if your backyard is, is in Woodlake because I'm on Lindale Avenue. Oh, yeah. I'm right across from Nature Center, so mm -hmm. I don't think they're coming over. I would just, yes, I'm assuming. Are. My daughter lives on Garfield and she's yeah. Yep. They're, they're all over. It's really busy, though. I'm thinking they won't come over they will. in rush hour. They will. <laughs> they will? They will? Yes. Well, yes. The yes. Is they will. yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> when I started 10 years ago, I was up at 42nd in France. There's a little park up there called Weber Park. And I talked to a garbage guy. And I happened, somehow coyotes came up. I don't remember how. And he said, oh, yeah. 
I see those all the time in Minneapolis. At 4 a.m., they're running down the alley. <laughs> I've got them in Minneapolis, Noodle Minnehaha Creek. Yeah, in Minneapolis, what are they eating? Garbage. <laughs> Why are they in Minneapolis? Because they've come from Chaska, Chanhassen, through Eden Prairie, and Edina, and Richfield, and Bloomington, and now they're in Minneapolis. They are everywhere. They can cross 94, they can cross 494, they can cross 35W, they can cross Highway 100. It's just a matter of time for them. They're like, and the ones that can't figure out traffic, they don't breed because they get hit. You know, it's simple, but they are there. So this, all that we've talked about for the last hour and a half does not remove emergency services from the equation. If there is an emergency, if there is a particularly aggressive coyote or anything that you really need help with, and it's an emergency, dial 911. Explain the situation to them and they'll get the appropriate resources out to you, okay? This does not remove that. It's not like, you know, everybody's doing the Pontius Pilate thing and washing their hands of it. This is a matter of, you know, you guys are there. If you see a coyote, you're there right now, no matter what. I don't care if Scotty is my chief engineer and he can beam me from point A to point B, there's gonna be a lag time before I get to you. Same thing for Charlie or anybody else responding. The only person that's there right now and has an immediate impact is you, but if it's an emergency, don't hesitate to call 911, okay? Did you guys have a chance to copy some of this? Okay. Um, this, the reason that I have this page here is simply to show you guys, if you take a look, for example, down here, this is just a small list of resources that I looked at before I ever arrived on what we've been talking about. I looked at the Urban Coyote Research website, which is out of Cook County, Illinois, right around Chicago. They're the longest running study on urban coyote populations in the world going on, what, 13, 14 years now. Um, the Humane Society, the Minnesota DNR, Denver, which has had huge problems with coyotes over the years. And I've been looking at, um, and there's some other ones, including um, Vancouver, British Columbia, um, Phoenix, LA, various smaller cities in, in California and stuff. What I've been looking at is, what have they done in the past? What worked for them, what didn't. Case in point, kind of juxtaposing, you know, kill strategies versus hazing. Denver had a particular park and they would cyclically, every so often they'd have big problems with coyotes in this one park. And they'd go in and they'd kill off coyotes and then the trouble would die back, literally, and subside. And then they'd have this grace period and then the, the coyotes would come back and then they'd go in and kill more and then they'd come back. And it got to the point where the coyotes would literally come up to picnickers, scare the picnickers off their food, and eat their food. Doesn't sound like a park I want to go to. So they looked at it and they figured, well, we killed them, and they came back. So we killed them again, and they came back again. So we killed them again and again, and they came back again and again. So let's try something different because Einstein, the smart little bugger he was, said the definition of insanity is trying the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Right? So Denver was not an idiot. They tried something different. They tried hazing. The park staff went out and they hazed the coyotes in that park. And magically, the coyotes left the picnickers alone. The park personnel would still see coyotes like early morning, late evening, but the coyotes weren't bugging the park people. And it stayed that way. I have yet to hear any problems with that park now. And that's been. I think five years, six years, something like that. So, I mean, we use a variety of sources to come to this conclusion, and we looked at what worked and didn't work and kind of settled on those things that did work. Um, I think I got the right one with this video. This is out of Vancouver, British Columbia, and this is a, an example of hazing. <clears throat> as a collection of livable cities, a model of urban comfort surrounded by nature. But sometimes those two worlds collide. I'm going to skip ahead because it's a three-minute video. 
There's a couple of things that aren't always nice to see. See, they're, that's a normal process. That's a normal uh, pace for them to walk. Now, here we go, chasing him. See how close we get? But if that doesn't work, we suggest going to the next step and reshaping their behavior by using a coyote shaker, which is 12 to 15 pennies in the can. And it's very loud, they're very sensitive to noise. As you can hear that, this lands next to the coyote or in and around the coyote, and it really spooks them and creates that fear that they're meant to have of uh, people and our pets. This time of year, with people out enjoying... So did you see, get kind of an idea of how close you could get to a coyote before he'd break and run? And that's a guy with a big camera on his shoulder. So, um, but this is just to illustrate that I don't take information from one source because if you get any sort of a solution from somebody that came from only one source, I'll guarantee it's a biased solution. In some way, shape, or form, it, it's biased. It's leaning towards something. So, now we're going to get into the identification piece. I'm going to probably move fairly quickly on this because I want to get you guys out of here by 9. We said it was going to be 7 to 9. Uh, we kind of belabored some of the, the points so that everybody was comfortable with it. Um, but this is one picture of a coyote. Notice he's kind of gray, and that's a red fox. We do have two different species of fox in this area. One is a red fox, and we'll show you some pictures of a gray fox later. Um, but again, coyotes are about so high, just above the knee, depending on how tall you are. And fox are smaller. They're just below the knee. Okay? There's also a finer build, but you can picture, if you put a bunch of brush in front of these guys and you're not really sure how far away they are, you can kind of see they look similar enough. You know, I can see where somebody would get that confused. Is it the ears? Uh, it's size mostly, and I mean, red fox are pretty red usually. Um, they generally have black ears, but there's so much color variation in them. It's kind of get a, if you can, look, watch your yard, try to be observant and kind of gauge you know, how far, like if you were to go out and put stakes out at, you know, your backyard, put a stake out at, you know, just above your knee high, and then another one that's only just below your knee, you can, kind of, anything you see back there, you'll be able to kind of gauge their size that way. They're also more delicate. The, uh -huh. the fox's feet also seem like they're more delicate. Or yep, oh, really? yeah, because they're smaller. Oh, they yeah. do, however, have the same tracking pattern. They always go foot and foot. Um, the tracks are different because of the size of the animal, but they're, they can be. I mean, for an untrained eye, it can be difficult to tell the difference. What about their scat to see any remains around? Um, All depends on what they're eye eating. Eye it's generally going to be, you know, bird, yeah, turn, yeah. Like it'll be medium dog size. Okay. It's mostly dog. Uh, what? So we, <laughs> yeah, yeah hair, often, right? <laughs> but to compare it against fox and stuff, it'll be kind of medium dog size versus small dog size. Um, so the, we talked about that. This is a bad angle, but you can kind of see, you know, coyotes markedly larger. Here's an example of how the coyote can actually vary in color, all the way from that grayish color, like what a lot of people would look at and say that's a gray fox, over to that tawny tan red color, real rich color. So it's a big variation in colors. Then we also have, those are both red fox. But you can see that there's also a color variation even within a red fox. And then nature throws us a curve because we have two different foxes. We've got the red fox and we've got the gray fox. They are little foxes. Yeah. Gray fox, they'll have about the same body frame, but they're going to be more squat and short. Um, they can actually, I think they're super cool because they can climb trees, but they will always have this gray cape and a black stripe <laughs> in their back. And then they'll have like that red mid body and a white belly. There's another coyote and fox faces. Again, you put a bunch of brush between you and them and some distance, and it's not going to be unlikely. It's not going to be out of the question that you might be confused as to what you're seeing. So if you see these guys in your backyard, get a picture if you can. That'll be a positive way for some of us that are more familiar with it to be able to tell you, yep, it's a coyote. Oh, that's a fox. And you guys have seen enough of them. You may know absolutely without a doubt that you have coyotes there. But you know some other people, it might be kind of a toss-up. Or you might, you rarely have both, but sometimes you do. The fox has been around. The fox yeah. are dead. Fox, if you have fox versus coyote, the fox lose. Yeah, 
yeah. unless you get a really clever one that is kind of on the fringe of a territory. Um, but why do they? Why are coyotes even here? For the same reason any other wildlife is here, because they can find food, shelter, and water here. Um, they don't have any competition for those resources. We talked about no bears, cougars, or wolves. Um, they're the top dog. They don't. Ha if they have no threats here, why would they move? Right? They've got their territories. They've got their food, shelter, water, and nobody's threatening them. Well, we, that goes back to hazing. Um, they also eat a boatload of stuff that we want them to. 42% of their diet is rodents, so mice, chipmunks, groundhogs, squirrels, things that we don't want around anyway. 22%, give or take, it depends a little bit on the environment, will be white-tailed deer, which have a tendency to eat all of our hostas, and they trample over our gardens, and you know we had some people that lost all of their rose bushes to white-tails. Um, although typically the deer that they take will be yearling fawns. Yes, ma'am. How often do they match as many as three? Usually those are going to be family groups, or it'll be like either individuals or pairs that will take down fawns. So, like, come spring, you're talking like April, May, June, July, when the fawns are still really young, then pairs and individuals can take them down. Otherwise, it'll be family groups. Okay? Now, and then you get into things like 23% of their diet is fruit, so apples and things like that. Um, now, here's 6% is grass. Now, I mean, we've seen our dogs and cats that are outside in the yard and will eat grass. Well, these guys will too, to the tune of one meal out of 20 will be grass. Now, to put things in perspective, this, is, this comes from the Chicago area, a well-established urban coyote population. Only 1% of their diet were domestic cats. Okay, it's only 1% of their diet, but it's our cats, right? Or our dogs, okay? Very small part of their diet, but a really big impact on how we perceive them and, and how it affects our lives, right? So I want to point out that they do a lot of pest control services for us. It's just that 1% of their impact on our lives that's so significant. And that's why we want to try to keep them away from us. Okay, they're very opportunistic. Yes, I know that's a raccoon in the picture. But coyotes will eat the same thing raccoons do. We talked about pet food and stuff like that, compost. Um, feed sites, please don't put anything out for the wildlife. I, I mean, bird feeders aside, I mean, we like watching birds. I've got three bird feeders myself. But don't be putting out cracked corn for the deer. Don't be putting out stuff for ducks and geese and things like that. I will guarantee if we all stop feeding wildlife today, not one thing will starve to death in Richfield, Edina, Bloomington, and Minneapolis. I guarantee it. Why would, um, why would they attack a large Doberman? We'll get into that when we talk about the seasons. Um, unattended pets. Coyotes are not gifted with a, a Stevenson's Guide to Wildlife. Their calculus when they see another animal is, is it small enough? Can I catch it, and will it taste good? They don't see Pomeranians, they see lunch. They don't see Persians, they see breakfast, okay? They're small mammals, they're on the menu, okay? Shelter, they will get underneath anything that gives them shelter from the elements, so whether it's a culvert, or underneath your shed, or underneath your deck, that's their shelter. So make sure you've got all the foundations for your outbuildings and your decks and everything secure. Keep things out of there. If coyotes and fox can't get under there, their food can. So if you don't want them in your yard, don't let things that they eat in your yard. Water, some water things you can do something about, bird feet or bird baths and things like that. Some things you can't. Minnehaha Creek, Nine Mile Creek, ponds. And you can't just go, Oh, don't want the creek anymore. But you can say, I don't want the bird bath anymore. But again, textbook, reality. I like having the bird bath. Okay, just be aware that can attract other wildlife. I like having a water feature in my landscape. Okay, just be aware things will come in and drink out of it. I like having koi in my pond. Just keep in mind that egrets and herons will come in and eat those things. I thank everybody in Indian Hills in Edina for feeding the osprey because the osprey will come down and they'll take out koi from people's koi ponds all the time 
and I think it's cool. <laughs> right. Not because, I mean, if people are willingly feeding my, the, the osprey in, in Edina um, koi, I'm happy for that. Okay, coyotes work on four seasons. Kind of like us, only different, okay? Right now, we're in the December through March phase. This is their breeding and, and mating territory, or time. This is when they're most vocal. This is when they're also most aggressive, socially and territorially. So, how does that translate into our world? Um, who was it that was asking about Dobermans and such? Okay. This is the time of year when large breed dogs are most at risk from coyotes. Not because they're food, but because they're a threat or a challenge to the territory, mating rights, and food rights. So, in coyote language, large breed canine comes on the same path at the same time every day. Translation, that's a routine hunting path that only happens when somebody's established a territory here. If this wasn't your territory, you wouldn't be on a routine path here. If you're transient and just moving through, I'll only see you once or twice and then you're gone. But if I see you every day at the same time, you're trying to live here and it's my territory. Okay? So when they're reestablishing their territorial boundaries and reestablishing pair bonding and mating rights, they're going to defend that against the larger breed dogs because they see them as threats. What that means, you will see things like the coyotes will parallel your path if you're walking a large breed dog. They may follow you. They may come out on the path in front of you. Okay? They're seeing that dog as a threat to their territory, mating rights, pair bonding, things like that. It's really important that you keep your dog close to you. Scare the coyote every chance you get. And wherever possible, however it fits into your schedule, vary your routine. Change your paths, your times, how long you're out, things like that. If you change your routine around so that you're not on the same path every day at the same time, you're not establishing a routine hunting pattern. Does that kind of make sense? Ma'am. So, but, so I go walking in the woods, I'm in the coyote's territory, and I can see how I'm saying that I'm invading the territory, et cetera, and trying to take over. But I'm in the coyote's territory. If I'm hazing it, I'm afraid it would go into the neighborhoods nearby. It will go away from you, yes. <laughs> It's not relocating to the neighborhood, right? It's going away from the threat, right? And now keep in mind, I understand probably for illustration and discussion you called that the coyote's territory, but your mentality needs to stay in place that it's your territory. Well, but you were just talking about how the coyote becomes territorial because it sees me yes. invading. Yes, yes. So the coyote sees it as its territory. I am invading, that's what I would Yes, say. now also keep, we have to kind of layer some of this, and it gets a little bit nuanced, right? Because coyotes do exist with other predators, like wolves and bears and things like that, right? So how do they do that? They stay out of their way. So if you establish yourself as a higher tier predator, i.e. a threat to the coyote, we all know that we're not gonna have coyote dinner tonight, right? But if the coyote perceives you as a threat, you have established yourself as a higher tier predator, okay? Bless you. And if you're able to do that, it's your territory first, their territory second, they fit in around you. Does that make sense? So if you keep the mentality that it's your territory, they can still kind of do their territorial thing around you. They just kind of duck and weave you because you're not, you're a threat to them, you are not a challenge to their territory, you're not a challenge to their pair bonding, you're not a challenge to their mating rights or their food rights. You with me? Yeah. Okay. So if it, you kind of lift yourself above that discussion. I'm not, I'm not trying to marry your mate. I'm not trying to take over your territory. I'm just gonna, I'm over you. You know, we may have to work against for food, but I'm not challenging you for mating rights or breeding rights or anything like that. And if, if you see me as a threat to you, then you're gonna avoid me and you'll eat the table scraps after I'm done. Does that kind of help? Yeah, I was just commenting on your last yep. thing, that they become very, more territorial because they're defending their areas. Yes. And so from their perspective, I'm invading their areas. That's all I was saying. Right, okay, I'm with you. 
All right. So when we move into like the March through May area, this is when they're actually establishing and using dens. Okay. If you, I mentioned earlier that they don't have dens right now. Okay. Because they have nothing to put in them. They don't have pups. Okay. This is when they're actually going to be uh, setting up their dens, whether it's under a shed or a, a hole they've dug in a hill or a culvert that they've co-opted for shelter or whatever. But the, the dens are for sheltering their pups. Do they not sleep in those dens if in the winter or something? No. Or they don't need it? They nope. Have nope. Uh, they have coats. Uh, how many of you have ever had parkas, either when you were kids or right now, and they've got that really luxuriant fur liner? I know I'm, I'm horribly impolitic by talking fur right now, but that's often coyote fur. Oh. They have a really thick, luxuriant coat that can keep them warm to well below zero. So if you've ever seen sled dogs, it's not quite as thick, but it's really darn near as thick as a, a sled dog, and sled dogs can sleep in 40 below. Oh. So yeah, coyotes are, are very able to, to sleep outside in cold, cold weather. But the dens are primarily for, for have birthing and rearing their pups. And that's what happens between March and May. They become less vocal. The other thing about like December through March, they're very vocal about telling everybody where they are because they want to make sure everybody knows where their boundaries are. That vocality, that how vocal they are, diminishes dramatically because they don't want to tell everybody where the pups are. Right? They also pull in their boundaries to more around the core areas, wherever they're denning. Right? They're not quite so concerned about the periphery of their territory. They're just going to kind of stay more in the core to help defend the, the den area. What are the males doing during this time? Not much. There's because generally... It, <laughs> just I, when I started the whole talk, I should have given the, the one caveat. There is no cookie cutter answer when it comes to coyotes. Okay? So when we're talking about living arrangements, we might be talking about an individual with a territory and they're not mating during this time frame, but they may be vocal saying, hey, this is my territory, keep out. They, or they could be living as a pair. We, they live as a pair? They, they can, pair? yep. So you have individuals, you've got pairs, and then you've got family groups or packs, right? So you have all of these things going on at the same time. They're very adaptable. All these things coexist within, within the species. There's no one way that they live. So um, as far as the, the dens are concerned, you, if you have a single one, they probably don't have a den. If you have a pair, they'll have a den because they're going to have their litter. The males, you, um, obviously pair, an individual could be male or female. Pairs will be one male and one female. If you have a family group, you may have several of either or both, but you're going to have a dominant pair. Does that make sense? OK. So the males are still there, and they're doing the same thing. During the rearing season, when the pups are a little bit more active, this is going to be May through September, the territorial behavior stays the same as the denning season, means that they're kind of concentrated around the core. Um, they're not as, as vocal, but the hunting activity does become a little bit more concentrated in like the, the quote nocturnal or crepuscular hours, but that's primarily because that's when their food's most active. If you take a look at the time of year we're talking, May through September, what other animals are active during that time frame, right? So you've got a lot of rabbits that are out at night. You've got you know, a lot of other animals that are active during this time frame. But in an urban setting, a lot of that gets all upset because coyotes don't care. They have nothing to worry about. And then the dispersal season. This is when mom and dad kick out all the teenagers. All the adolescent coyotes get kicked out to go find their own territory. Because, no cookie cutter answer, every territory, the coyotes that live in their territories, will all set their own rules. So if, if mom and dad want to stay as a pair and they don't want the kids around, they kick them all out. If mom and dad want a family group, they'll keep some of them and kick the rest out. Um, the other thing is that every territory has a natural carrying capacity. If there's not enough food for everybody, somebody's got to go. The other thing that controls population, there's disease controls, there's social controls, and things like that. So I know in Edina, about three years ago, we had a huge wave of distemper that came through and wiped out almost, all, well, probably about half of the raccoons. That also impacted fox and some of the coyotes, too. 
but you'll have, just like we have flu seasons, they also have disease waves that come through and, and reduce the population. So it's not like you're going to go from two to two million coyotes. There's a carrying capacity. There's a load um, bearing ability in the, in the territory, and that will control the populations. And that's why this dispersal season is so important. But some of the behavior you'll see here, the adolescents are looking for their own territory. So they, they're trying to find an unoccupied territory. And so they're more mobile because they keep bouncing into all these other territories that are already occupied. And they can't stay there, so they have to move. And they can't stay there, so they have to move. And because of this mobility, they're more visible. And we see them more often in, in the kind of September through December time frame. Okay? So keep in mind, we're not on their menu. Yes, sadly, our smaller pets are. You know, uh, the larger dogs, they, they're at greatest risk because of the territorial things between December and May or so. But unfortunately, our smaller pets are always on the menu. So we always have to be careful with them. But we don't have anything to worry about. They're only, they only present problems if we allow them to. Hopefully, some of the hazing techniques that we talked about and being able to understand their behavioral patterns will give you a sense of control over the situation so you won't be quite as timid or, or concerned. And you'll be able to take control of those situations. Um, they perform a lot of pest removal services for us. When one or two percent of their diet is human or pet related, yes, it's a huge impact on us. I'm not taking anything away from that. But please keep in mind that 97, 98 percent of their diet is removing pests and unwanted wildlife from our, our yards and gardens and things like that. You can control almost every encounter. If for any reason any of the coyotes are really aggressive, don't hesitate to call 911. If they're coming after you for some reason, don't hesitate to call 911. We talked about the frequency of coyote attacks on humans. They're way, way so infrequent that I wouldn't even entertain the idea of it being a concern. That's all I've got. Whatever questions you guys have for me, I'd be happy to answer. But if you have questions for these guys, I really appreciate you guys kind of suffering through this long, dull, boring conversation. But I think it has some important information. And hopefully, it gives you guys some tools that will enable you guys to, to manage it. And I'd be more than happy to make myself available by phone or, or whatever if I can help you guys out in any way. Yes, ma'am. My name is Tim, as in Timothy, Hunter, as in the controversial pastime. So, and I'm available over in Edina, so um, feel free. Um, I work Monday through Thursday. I, do, I am out on the street a lot, so if you wind up getting put into my voicemail, please don't panic. I will try to get back to you as soon as I can. All right, thank you. Yeah. We're going to have this entire presentation of